first chapter. Second Peter, the first chapter. Let's stand for the reading of God's word. Second Peter, the first chapter. Here is the reading of God's word for the sermon on the Lord's Day morning. Hear God's word. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours, by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness, through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. This is the reading of God's inerrant, infallible, immutable and holy word and all who heard it said amen. amen you may be seated we're continuing in our series this morning we're recognizing the importance of spiritual growth the overarching uh, emphasis over the last few weeks and over the next few weeks as the lord leads us is guarding growing and glorifying our key text for that was taken from second peter the third chapter and we recognize, and I'll take you to that in a few moments, you recognize how important that is for us. And I'm so encouraged by so many uh, witnesses and testimony amongst you of how the, that word of guarding, growing, and glorifying is impacting your spirit and your heart. I made it very clear to you that I can deal as a pastor with a small congregation in numbers. No problem with that. What we can't deal with, what we won't deal with, what we find unacceptable and really sorrowful, really, is a small congregation physically, but also a small congregation spiritually. It's okay to have a small number of people physically, but it's not okay to have a, a congregation that is small spiritually. That we will not settle for spiritual underdevelopment in the men and the women and the families and the children of our church. We will not settle for spiritual undevelopment. We will not settle for spiritual immaturity. We will not just settle for spiritual dwarfism and spiritual midgetry. We will not settle for, an, for, for a lack of discernment and a lack of maturity. We will not settle for just being weak and fragile. What we must settle for is the high standard that God calls every one of us to, into discernment and maturity and strength and wisdom in him that we may indeed be spiritual giants that we may indeed be men and women of God who our children and our grandchildren and children after them will say ah but my grandfather or my uncle or my brother and sister in Christ was a man who stood tall and women who stood tall in what God had grown in them and so we will not settle for the standard of other churches we will not settle for the standard of Christianity in this United Kingdom where men and women merely go to a church and look at the lights on the screen or the songs being sung and the activities of the church and the coffee and the cake and the tradition of the church where people just gather together and find that they settle for that. We will not settle for that. There is a high standard that God requires. There are many clubs that pe people can belong to and by all means we say go belong to them. But the church is the church. And the people of God be the people of God, that they might indeed grow in God. So guarding, growing, and glorifying. Now if, you're a mem if you're a newcomer this morning, if you're visiting with us, and those watching by way of YouTube uh, um, uh, for the recorded uh, uh, broadcast, you can go back and look at those previous sermons on that over the last few weeks. We do pray that that may indeed encourage your soul and convict your heart to bring you to a place of spiritual growth. Now... We recognize that, and this is, I don't mean to be morbid about this, but listen to what I say to you today. 
Especially even as we quoted Paul in his writing to Timothy saying, listen, grow spiritually, discipline yourself to grow spiritually, for bodily discipline has little benefit for you. In other words, bodily exercise has little benefit for you. And you know I was talking in reference and in context to what Paul, we think, is making known of the Isthmus Games. The Isthmus Games were the, 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 the forerunner of the Olympic Games. So Paul uses the analogy, the illustration of training for those games. Bodybuilding, training, exercise, you're disciplining your body for those kind of games, those kind of activities, that kind of uh, a competition in sport that is of little benefit for you. Why? Because the result, the end result, is merely a temporal crown. And Paul says, discipline yourself for that which is eternal. Train yourself towards godliness. And I don't mean to be morbid as I say this. Listen to me carefully. Every one of us are preparing, spending so much time in this world for that which is dying. In fact, right now, you are one step closer to death. Today, you're one step closer to that day. You're one step closer to the grave than you were yesterday. And so tomorrow you'll be one step closer to the grave, even further to the grave. And again, I don't mean to sound morbid in this, but here's the reality. Every day we are preparing for that which is dying. It's going to die. We put so much of time and energy and money spent on that which is dying. And yet we spend so little on that which is living. That which is living is not the body. That which is living is not the stem to life. That which is living is the soul. And we must indeed, if we come to the, rea the realization of this reality, that we're putting all our effort into that which is dying, we must put our effort into that which is living our very soul. And that's why Paul says, train yourself in godliness. Train yourself for that which is eternal. A spiritual life. And so here Peter makes the same case. Peter makes the same case. The beginning then, let's begin to exposit the text. Let's begin to expound on the text this morning. Uh, the, the, the beginning of the book of uh, Second Peter in chapter 1 harmonizes with the end of the book. One of the things we need to look at when we talk about uh, biblical hermeneutics, one of, one of the big things we look at when we understand a text, how do we look at the text, is how does the text harmonize with another text? How do these two texts work together? There's a harmony there. We can see what the writer's trying to do. We can see what God's trying to do through the men who pen the words. So 1 Peter says what you've read concerning knowledge. And then if you, rem if you remember the end of uh, 2 Peter, let's go to the end of 2 Peter. The end of 2 Peter, the last few verses, the doxology in verse 18. Remember what, what is a doxology? The, dox the doxology is the high praise unto God. Peter concludes with a high praise unto God. He says in verse 18 of uh, chapter 3, But grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen, he says. So he begins with what it means to grow in Christ, and he ends with what it means to grow in Christ. This is his, this is his objective here. This is his motive here. This is the goal here. To cause the church to grow in Christ. As a pastor, I'm dedicated to your growth. To stir you on, to encourage you to grow even further. What do I say even about the men that we're training to preach in our church? That you must be even better preachers than me. We want you to do well in Christ. We want you to be a better expositor of the text than I am. A better preacher of the gospel in Bristol brought me than I am. We want you to do well in Christ. Grow in Christ. Be a better husband. Be a better wife. Be a better family. Be a more godly family. And Peter is helping us here. To that end, God has not left us on our own. Beloved in Christ, God has not left us on our own to achieve that goal. We're growing in uh, growing in Christ has been wonderfully provided the Lord's provision. The Lord's provision for our spiritual growth. God is good and gracious in this. He didn't say, I want you to grow. He didn't say, listen to Peter. Peter says you need to grow, grow in grace and, and grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ and then leave you to find your own way about what that means. 
He doesn't do that. He would be an irresponsible father if he did that. But responsible and wise as God is, he gives us the instruction, he gives us uh, the, the reason, he gives us the ways on how we are to grow in him. Remember, like, remember, like we said, uh, brothers and sisters in Christ, remember what did we say? We said that we are on a journey. Um, we are on a journey. Where are we going, you may ask? Well, we're going towards the new heaven and the new earth. Our journey is towards the new heaven and the new earth. This is the journey of every believer. The, the, the journey of the unbeliever is different from your journey. The journey of the unbeliever, if he dies without Christ, the journey of the unbeliever is to the lake of fire. First to hell, if he dies before the second coming of Jesus Christ, if he dies before the coming of the Lord, his, 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 the first destination for him would be hell. The second destination, the second death would be when he's raised from the dead and brought before the great white throne judgment and God will give him the judgment that Satan also will have and Satan's demons will have, which is they will be confined and condemned to the lake of fire. So they'll be raised out of hell, given their new bodies and be uh, uh, judged and condemned and confined to the lake of fire. But that's not your eternal destination if you be in Christ. If you're being Christ today, if you're born again today, if you're a new creation today, the lake of fire and the great white throne judgment is not your eternal destination. Your eternal destination is the new heaven and the new earth. The new heaven and the new earth. What did we say to the young people, the many young people who gathered yesterday to listen to us? We said to them, Greta Thunberg is not your role model. She has nothing to offer you except fear. Now come to, if you're so worried about the earth, come to know Jesus Christ who tells you that this is how it's all going to end. God's going to create a new heaven and a new earth. So you and I as believers in the Lord are heading towards a new heaven and a new earth. And this heading towards that place is what we call our pilgrimage, our journey towards a new heaven and the new earth. And as we journey towards the new heaven and the new earth, we are journeying through this land. We're journeying through this earthly realm. And as we journey through this earthly realm, God has not left us without help. He's given us the help we need to live a godly life even in this earthly realm. That we can even indeed grow as we journey through this earthly realm. That as we encounter, as we, uh, encounter the problems and the obstacles and the hurdles and the afflictions of this world, that those are indeed opportunities for us to grow. That we may say, even as Paul, uh, as it has been said of Paul, he's run his race well. He's finished the course. He's run the race well. That, that it might be said of us that at the end of our life, that we indeed ended well. Ah, I fear, my friends. I fear my brothers and sisters in Christ. I fear indeed for the souls of Christians who when we go to a funeral, we hear people say, oh, so-and-so had a BSc degree, got a master's in this, uh, went on to work at uh, uh, this university and worked at that hospital, was a senior nurse here or a doctor here or an IT person here and worked for this government department and they, we talk about how well the person has done here on earth, but we speak very little of how well they've done spiritually. They have not finished well. They've run the race of academia. They run the race of acquiring in the world. They run the race of all these things. But we cannot say, ah, this man did well. He ended well. Ah, when he died, he was professing uh, Christ on his deathbed. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we are far from the godly examples of men and women before us or even in their last breath would glorify the Lord, would glorify the Lord indeed. And so it is my prayer and my belief that we can indeed be a small church that finishes well, that finishes well, finishes well indeed. It is my desire for you as a pastor that you would finish well. Oh, do I want you to have the, the, the things of this world? Yes, I'll pray for you to be clothed well. I'll pray for you to eat well. I'll pray for you to get a good job. But my prayer over all of this is that you be a good Christian. You grow well in Christ. That you finish well. 
that it may be said of you, this person finished well in Christ. And so Peter says to us in 1 Peter chapter 1, we'll begin. As we begin in chapter 1, we, my, my, my introduction seems a bit long this morning. I don't normally have such a long introduction. My, my, in, in, as we begin in chapter 1, we find that um, Paul makes mention of the word knowledge at the beginning of the chapter, uh, the, the beginning of the book, as he does make mention of the word knowledge at the end of the book. We spoke about how it harmonizes. He wants us to grow in knowledge. And that word knowledge is used also uh, 11 times in other words in the book uh, of Second Peter. So almost 11 times. But there is another word that is also repeated a number of times. And that word is lust. Lust. It's repeated a number of times in the book. In the book of uh, Second Peter chapter 1, looking at verse 4, verse 4 says, for by, these he has granted us, uh, he has, uh, uh, for by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. That's the first part. That's the first time it's mentioned. In chapter 2, in verse 10 of chapter 2, we find the word repeated here as well in um, verse 10. Uh, and, and, and especially those who indulge the flesh in its corrupt desires and despise authority. The corrupt despise, indulge the flesh there is the lust. In verse 18 of the same chapter, it says, for speaking out against, for speaking out arrogant words of vanity and entice the fleshly desires by sensuality, those who barely escape from the ones who live in error. Again, the, the sensuality there, the corrupt there is the lust. And in chapter 3 and verse 3, it says, Know this first of all, that in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts. And so this word lust is repeated a number of times in the book. What's the point the preacher is making this morning? Well, the book is about deliverance from the corrupt nature, deliverance from the corrupt ways, deliverance from the lust, so that we can flourish in another way. Lust equals decay. Lust equals defeat. And knowledge here in the Bible, especially knowledge of Christ, equals growth. Growth in Christ. And this word, victory in Christ. And so you have lust, and then you have knowledge. You have lust, which is death and decay. Then you have knowledge, which is uh, uh, knowledge in Christ, which is equals uh, growing in Christ, which equals victory in Christ. So Peter is basically teaching from the, from the first chapter to the last chapter, he's teaching us how to be delivered from lust and corruption and to grow in the knowledge of Christ. So delivered from one life into another life. So delivered from lust and corruption and to grow in the knowledge of Jesus. And Peter knows this wonderfully well. He's testifying of his own life. Let me have a, well, we can, I'll give you proof of that. If you look at, um, go to the left with me and look at First Peter. Uh, in First Peter, um, the fourth chapter of First Peter. In the fourth chapter of First Peter, um, looking especially at verse one to verse six, Peter says this: Therefore, since Christ has suffered the flesh, suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose, because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin so as to live the rest of the time in the flesh no longer for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. For the time already past is sufficient for you to have carried out the desires of the Gentile, having pursued a course of sensuality, lust, drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. In all this, they are surprised that you do not run with them into the same excesses of dissipation, and they malign you, uh, but they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For the gospel has for this purpose been preached even to those who are dead, that, that though they are judged in the flesh as men, they may live in the spirit according to the will of God. So Peter here is talking about his own life. He's talking about his own testimony. He's talking about your life, of how he once lived. He talked about, he's talking about the lust of the flesh. He's talking about that dissipation. He's talking about the drinking and the parties and the abominable idolatries that he, he lived in and which all of us lived in before Christ. 
And now we are not, not to live in them anymore. And Paul makes a similar story. Paul makes a similar, not a story, a similar case in the book of Galatians concerning the fruit of the Spirit uh, compared to the fruit of the flesh. He says you're no longer in, in the flesh, indulging the flesh, celebrating the flesh, but you're of the Spirit, and he talks about how we are to pursue the things of the Spirit. In other words, there must be some things that are recognizable in our lives. That if you look at me, you must be able to recognize the work of God in my life. As I look at you, I must be able to recognize the work of God in your life. I must not be able to see death and decay through lust. I must be able to see knowledge of Christ and the victory that you have in your life. And this is what Peter is trying to do here. If we could, if we could title the sermon another way, we could title it, How to be free from lusts. So Peter knows this beforehand, like I said. He, he tells us this in 1 Peter chapter 4. So, Let's unpack this for a moment. Let's unpack this for a moment. We say we will end well. We say that we want to end well, as Paul says. Uh, this flesh, this lust that uh, Peter makes known here, is opposite to our growth. So that's one of the first points I want to make here. And still my introduction is this long. <laughs> I don't normally have this long introductions. We launch straight into the text normally. But listen to this as we go into the text. The purpose of the preaching this morning, the purpose of the preaching and teaching over the last couple of weeks and over the next few weeks is that how, how you may grow in Christ and grow in the knowledge of God. What hinders that growth, what spoils that growth, what's a hurdle and obstacle to that growth is the lust that Peter is talking about here in 2 Peter. It opposes that growth. The fleshly ways oppose the growth in Christ. Our brother wonderfully prayed this morning as we recognize he's quoting from um, First Peter where Peter says that Satan roars around, goes around like a roaring lion seeking whom, whom, whom he may devour. We, under, we understand what that means. We understand that it is an external threat. When Satan comes from the outside, he's an external threat. He comes from the outside to seek whom he may devour, which is you and I. But understand, as we understand there's an external threat, we must also understand there's an internal threat. The internal threat to your growth is the work of the flesh. It's the corrupt nature. It hinders your growth. And you know very well what I'm talking about. Haven't you felt it? I have felt it many times. When you so want to grow in Christ, and you do that one thing that wants to make you vomit out, the one thing that makes you feel like you want to fall on your knees and cry out to God, that one thing that you've done from the flesh that's caused you to fall so many times. And you cried out unto God, God, deliver me from this, from this wretched thing, from this fleshly nature. I don't want to do these things anymore, Lord. I don't want to watch these things anymore. I don't want to see those things anymore. I don't want to touch those things anymore. But I find myself doing it, Lord. And every time I do it, I go further away from you. And the further away I go from you, the less I grow in you. I know that's my life. I know it's your life. And Peter here helps us to say that there's a threat externally, which is the devil. And there's a threat internally. And the threat internal is our own corrupt nature. Our own corrupt nature. God knowing this, God knowing that we struggle with this, Provided for us. He provides for us. And so in Second Peter, the first chapter, Simon Peter, a bond servant of the, of the, and apostle of Jesus Christ. We recognize that this Simon Peter is indeed a bond servant. A doulos of Christ. A bond servant. He's, he's a slave to Christ. Uh, we've been delivered from one slavery to another. The slavery we have been delivered from is we be, we're a slave to sin before Christ. Shackled and chained to sin. Christ delivers us from that sh uh, shackles. He breaks into the prison cell of sin and delivers us from sin. But he shackles us now to himself. We are fettered now to Christ. We are bound to Christ. We belong to him. We are his subjects. He has taken us captive. If you remember, I preached and I said that the Roman ruler would walk down the, uh, would march down the street and, and he would display all that he has taken captive of. 
And Christ is the ruler over our lives, and he demonstrates who he has taken captive. He's taken captive you and I, in a good way, in a glorious way. I want to be captured by Jesus Christ. I want to be arrested by him. I want to be enslaved to him. And so Simon Peter has no problem saying, I'm a bond servant, an, an apostle of Jesus Christ. And without going any further, you know, we have been teaching during the week, midweek service on the uh, Apostle Paul from uh, First and Second Corinthians, that, that they are called apostles in the sense of true apostolic calling. The men and women today, well, the, well you know, the, the women don't even qualify to be called apostles, but there are so many women around the world who are calling themselves pastors and apostles. We know that to be absolutely error. There is no way a woman can preach the Bible to a church of men and women together. A woman is not called to preach or teach or pastor or be an apostle. A woman can teach other women. A woman can teach her own children at home. But she certainly, by scripture, is not called to preach or teach a church. It's against the scriptures. It is a man who is called to be the preacher and the teacher in a church. A good God has made it so. It's the design of the family that he's following. The man is the head of the home, not the woman. So it's the design of the family that's in the church. And so we find that he's a true apostle of Jesus. And again, we say, why is he recognized as a true apostle? The, apostol the, the, the apostolic calling and the apostolic trademarks of Paul and Peter and the rest of the apostles are different from those who call themselves apostles now. These apostles of the Bible are men who have saw Jesus Christ heard Jesus Christ, spent time with Jesus Christ. The men of today who call themselves apostles cannot compare themselves and equal themselves, sorry, with the apostle Peter and Paul and the rest of the apostles because they have not seen Jesus. They have not heard Jesus. They have not spent time with Jesus in the same way that the apostles did. But you have many today who do call themselves apostles. I see them not as apostles. But Peter here says, I am the apostle and bondservant of Jesus Christ. He says, to those who have received a faith, who is he talking about? The church, the ecclesia, the ecclesia, the called out ones. To those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours. It's the same faith that, it's the same faith that Peter has. It's the same faith that you have. What is that faith? It's our faith in this. It is our faith in Jesus Christ. The confession of our faith, that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, for the glory of God alone. This is the great and glorious faith that we proclaim and confess. The same kind of faith as Peter, as ours, he says to the church, and by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He tells us by whom it comes. By our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Verse 2, grace and peace be multiplied to you. You know that I am a firm believer and a proponent of how we speak biblically. I made the case that we, 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 we do not want to speak with emojis. And even if you don't hear me on the text, hear me on this. Speaking through emoji, emojis is intellectually low. <laughs> you didn't go to school to learn to speak with emojis. Imagine you went to school and you write an essay with emojis. I double dare you to hand over your university thesis with emojis. Oh, the, 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 the lecturer will understand me when I put praying hands together. He'll give you a praying hand with the zero. We speak with emojis, we're dumbing down. We're becoming low in our intellect by speaking with emojis. Use your words. Grace and peace be multiplied to you. Gracious greetings. I tell you, my friends, this is the, is the way Christians have spoken, and I pray will continue to speak this way until the second coming of Jesus Christ. I have made it my mission to speak that way. I will never respond with an emoji ever in any of my messages. Why? Because there's great value in saying the word grace. There's great value in saying the word peace. To who? To you. Grace and peace to you. And so it says, grace and peace be multiplied to you. How? In the knowledge, Peter says, in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. In the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Now, all that God wants us to know has been given to us in Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ. I am not seeking a new experience in God. In other words, I'm not speaking something, let me just rephrase that. I'm not experiencing a new experience in a new revelation of God. 
There is nothing outside the Bible that qualifies as revelation today. Everything that God wants to reveal to us, everything that God wanted to reveal to us, he has already revealed it to us in the Bible. So my new experience must be in what has already been revealed to us. Do you understand me this, this morning? I must look at what has already been revealed to us. Jesus Christ has already been revealed to us. And my new experience is in the revelation that has already come to us through Jesus Christ. And again, it is in Jesus Christ. It is through Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. And I want to, sh I want to share this with you. He says, he says, he says in verse 3, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him. There is a, when, when Peter says there's a true knowledge, he's giving us the positive. In the, in, the, in, the, in, in the grammatical construct of the text, he's saying true knowledge. If he's saying true knowledge, he's also saying there must be a false knowledge of Jesus Christ. We must grow in the true knowledge of Jesus Christ. So we remind ourselves, what's the false knowledge that we need to be aware of? Of Jesus Christ. The false knowledge of Jesus Christ is like what we heard yesterday in Bristol Broadmead. The false knowledge of Jesus Christ is what you hear from Hindus and Muslims. The false knowledge of Jesus Christ is what you hear from atheists and agnostics. Oh, you shouldn't be speaking about this matter of, uh, of sexuality. You shouldn't be speaking about homosexuals and transgender people this way. Isn't your God a God of love and accepts everybody the way they are? Well, I'm making a podcast at the moment where I'm addressing a, a Swami from um, um, Germany. Uh, he's Mauritian born, he lives in Germany, and he's a Hindu, um, Hindu Swami, Sri, some, Sri Vishwananda something, and I'm, I'm addressing him in my podcast where he says, listen, he says, listen, he says, he was asked the question about, uh, about, about homosexuals and uh, transgender people. He says, oh, who are we to judge? God made them this way, he says. God made them this way. Oh, who are we to say who they must be? And then he goes on to say, didn't Jesus say, don't judge them? Uh, you know, that just caught my attention. I got, I got, there's a holy anger that came upon me. One, firstly, because God did not make them that way. We're sinners, not because God made us sinners. We're sinners because of what sin is. And God didn't make them that way. God says, Paul says, you can be delivered from that way. How? You can be born again. So I'm addressing him in my podcast. And in the podcast, making very clear that there is a true knowledge of Jesus Christ. And like this man incorrectly quoted and said, oh, didn't Jesus say? Well, his actual words were, Jesus says in his first commandment, you shouldn't judge. Number one, it's not the first commandment that you shouldn't judge. And number two, he's misquoting and misrepresenting Jesus. The point of my, of my narrative over the last few seconds is that a lot of people are presenting a false Christ. A false Jesus. Our purpose as a church, your purpose as a believer, must be to come and grasp the true Jesus Christ. The true Jesus Christ. What did the true Jesus Christ say about this, this, and this? How does he want me to respond to this, this, and this? Paul, Paul says it, and yeah, even Peter says it, that there is a knowledge of Christ that is false, but there is a knowledge of Christ that is true. That we are indeed to grow in the true knowledge of Christ. He says in the, true, in, the, in the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. Underline the word called us there. The word called us there is important. It speaks of a great and glorious doctrine in our church, in the reformed church. And it is the doctrine of effectual calling. It's, a doctrine, it's, it's the doctrine of God's sovereign calling. Peter says this, he says, yeah, he says, listen, by the true knowledge of, of him who called us, not of you who chose him, but of him who called us. We believe that the Bible says that when, uh, Jesus says, you did not choose me, but I chose you. I chose you. You had no way to choose him. Why? Because you know this to be true. You know the answer to the question, right? How would you answer the question? Think about it for a moment. Think about it for a moment. You know the answer to the question. Why is it that you did not choose Christ, but Christ chose you? You know the answer to the question. Think about it for a moment. I'm not going to ask you to stick your hand up to give me the answer, but you know the answer to the question. And the answer to the question is that dead people cannot choose Christ. 
Dead people do not choose Christ. What do I mean by that? I mean Ephesians chapter 2, Paul makes it clear. You were once dead in your trespasses and sins. Dead people, people who are dead in sin, cannot choose Christ. Unless Christ chooses them first. How? By opening, by effectual calling. By the Spirit of God opening up their hearts to show them their sin and their need of a Savior. So when they say, I do, when they say, I accept Christ, it is Christ who accepted them first. Therefore, they say, I accept Christ. And so this is the great and glorious effectual calling, the doctrine of sovereign election. And we've been called by his own glory and excellence. Now, let's back up a little bit and look at these two other words that are given to us from verse 2. The word is granted. Granted. Verse 2 says, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted to us. That's the first reference to granted. And uh, we recognize that this word granted is an important word. What does it mean when he says he had granted it to us? It means he has given it to us. Uh, uh, the verb here, yeah, the action word here, yeah, the verb here yeah, is uh, something that is not is being done, but has been done. It's past tense, past verb, past action. So it's uh, granted to us. Can you see what the word is there? Seeing that his divine power has granted already to us. It's past, it's done. It's been given to us. It has already been done, past tense verb. From when? When, when has it been done? From the time of your salvation. From the time of your salvation, this has been granted to you. If you can recall the day of your salvation, if you can recall that day when your life changed, then that's the day it's been, been granted to you. But that granting for you took place way before that. It's been accomplished on Calvary's cross more than 2,000 years ago by Jesus Christ. So at the moment of your salvation, that has been given to you. I put it to you this way, my friends. I put it to you this way. You envy people. You envy people who have been born, they use, you, uh, the world says this, with a silver spoon in their mouth. The silver spoon meaning they've been given every privilege in life and everything has been given to them. They have the silver spoon. They're born with the silver spoon. I tell you, my dear friends, you that are born again are far more better. You're better off than those who have been born with the proverbial silver spoon. Why? Because when you were born again, Christ has granted to you everything for life and godliness. Amen and amen. Everything for life and godliness has been granted to you when you were born again in Jesus Christ. So God has already provided for you to live a godly life and to grow in a godly life. In Christ is the reservoir, the fountain, the wonderful continuous outflowing of God into your life. At the moment of your salvation, it flowed into your life. It began with his love being poured out upon your heart, as Paul says in the book of Romans. His love has been poured out upon your hearts, and that's, that, that outpouring continues. And it comes from a God whose fountain never runs dry. It comes from a God whose water levels never decrease. It comes from a God whose supply never ends. It continues to flow into your life. A continuous flow from God. Never empty. Never ceasing. It always flows to the believer. And this has been granted, Peter says. Beloved in Christ. Let that be a sober reality for you this morning. That if you be a believer in Christ today, God has already prepared for you by granting you all that is needed for spiritual growth. And I say to you right now, as I say this to you, you don't need Joyce Meyer of all the people in the world. You don't need her 10 steps of how to do better spiritually. You don't need anybody from God TV and Revelation TV and all the other nonsense junk out there. You don't need any of them to tell you how to have three better steps to a spiritual life. Well, their three better steps to a spiritual life involve some sort of giving on your part, which is a thousand pounds or something towards them. You don't need any of them. God has already given it to you free of charge in his word how to grow. He lets you know that this has been granted to you really at the moment of your salvation. So we reckon now that this is a fountain that never runs dry. 
You don't have to give anything to receive it. No amount of money any month. You don't have to send them your offering. You don't have to sign up to their newsletter. You don't have to do any of that to get this. God has already provided it for you free of charge. And that word granted is a beautiful word there. I love it. I love it. I'm comforted by it. I'm encouraged by it. I'm jubilant about it because I think about it and I think, wow, God has already seen how to take care of me that I may grow spiritually. All that is needed to overcome now the defeat is to grow in the knowledge of Christ. Verse 1. Oh, 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 oh. We, won't, we, won't, we won't go back to verse 1. Let's look at verse Verse 2. Verse 2. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ. Seeing, verse 3, sorry. Seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. Divine power. Divine power is the word divinity. From the way, the way you get the word divinity from. Our God is divine, meaning he's not man. He's not of the earthly realm. He's divine. We recognize his divinity in these words. He's omnipotent, omnipresent. And so we recognize that he's eternal, meaning he has no beginning or end. He's the uncaused cause. As we speak to atheists and evolutionists, we say when they ask who, who made God, who created God, we say he's the uncaused cause. That's the definition of God in the Christian worldview. So by his divine power, he says, that grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge, growing in the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ, seeing, seeing brothers and sisters, that his divine power has granted to us everything. Everything comes by his divine power for this growth in Christ. Meaning that it has no earthly human origin. This flow from God, this fountain from which we receive, this well from which we drink, has no human source. It's not the philosophies of men. It doesn't come from Joel Olstein's how to live a better life now. Or how to have your best life now. It comes from the fountain of him who is divine. It comes from divine power. From God. And therefore it never ends, therefore it doesn't cease. It says here, everything, everything that pertaining to life and godliness, everything pertaining to life meaning anything that you can, anything that you can come across in life. How many of you say, so? How, how many of you said, well, God, if you only know this situation, Lord. God, if you only know that's what I'm facing. God, if you only know about this, and God, if you only know about that. He knows everything about life. He's given us everything about life. He's granted to us all the help we need for everything in life. He says, listen, he says, pertaining to life and godliness. Godliness meaning uh, looking more like Christ, being transformed more into the likeness of Jesus Christ, being the light that shines into the world. Being the example of Christ in the world today, both to your family and to those outside your family. And this life and godliness through, this happens through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. Now, as we said earlier on a few minutes ago, this true knowledge of him does not come from spending time on TikTok. This true knowledge of him doesn't come by just closing your eyes and imagining. This true knowledge doesn't come by spending time on a good documentary about Jesus Christ. This true knowledge doesn't come by watching a film about Jesus Christ. This true knowledge comes from what God has already granted to us. His revelation of who he is. His revelation of who he is. If I'm going to grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, if I'm going to grow in the true knowledge of Jesus Christ, I must grow in discipline of his word. 
May that be one of the things you add to your prayer list today and this week is, Lord, help me to grow in discipline of your word. If I read two chapters a day, help me to read a little more today. That's my goal. If I read three chapters a day, help me to read a little bit more, Lord. If I read just one chapter a day, help me to read two more today, Lord. If I read two verses today, help me to read two more verses, Lord. And so each and every one grows differently, but you're growing in Christ, asking the Lord to help you uh, to recognize that which he's already given you. He's already given you this. He's granted it already. You have the word before you. It is indeed sad. Sad indeed. One of the, in all of my debates and discussions, and even whether it's online, podcast, or in the public square, or in the church, you find the glaring reality in the church. The sad, glaring reality is that we are without the word of God. We are without the word of God. What I mean by that is that Christians cannot show in their life that they know the word of God. They may pick up what somebody says here and what somebody says there, but they cannot engage in a discussion truly from the word of God. And that is a sad and tragic state for the church. This true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence it, the, the true knowledge of him comes by what God has already provided for us, granted us. It is in the precious and holy word. As Charles Spurgeon said, we need to um, dust off the Bible. As the people of old used to speak about, you know, and I, and I make the case, I make the case not for a phone. You know, if you walk, if you are here, we're here today with the phone, I'm not speaking against you. I don't condemn you. But I want something that is precious and holy and right before me. I get the convenience of the phone, I get that. I get the convenience of devices, I get that. But for me, for me in the way I grow, in the way I see God's word, there's something special and unique about the pages of this book, the pages of the Bible, about holding a Bible and keeping it separate and different from the rest of the things of the world. Your Bible, your phone has as videos and pictures and all sorts of other things on it. But your, your Bible is kept differently from that. And again, I'm not condemning you if you're using a phone this morning. I'm not looking at you and saying, woe is you this morning. But I'm asking you to begin with discipline. This is my Bible. This is the word of God. When I open it, I see Christ in it. And part of that discipline is recognizing that this is the book I sit before. I open its pages. I ask God to lead me and guide me. Holy Spirit, help me today as I read the text to know what it means. So there's reading it. And then there's understanding it. Well, reading it is one thing which is good. It's a good start. But then there comes the understanding of it. The understanding of it comes from the interpretation of it. And the interpretation of it is important, my dear friends. And so your need for that you need a church that has the gift of God amongst them, which is the teacher of the word. God has given the teacher to the church. Not that you cannot learn on your own. You can indeed. But God has helped us by granting, by giving to us already the gift to the church. And the gift to the church is the teaching gift. The teaching gift that comes from the teacher to the church. And the teacher must be able to, like on days like this, bring the church together and bring God's word, rightly dividing it, as Paul says to Timothy, that it may be fed to God's people. If there be an interpretive challenge, that the teacher must be able to unpack that and say, this is what the interpretive challenge is. And this is how we understand what it means. That if one has a question, the teacher must be able to say, okay, this is what the answer is. And if one is confused about that particular text, the teacher must be saying, let me help you to understand what that means. We understand from interpretation what it is. And then we have from interpretation the understanding, and from the understanding we go further to the application of it. How does this impact my life? What do I do with what I've just learned? That entire process has been given to us, granted to us already in the gift of God to the church. So the word of God. So if you're listening over the last few minutes, what are you paying attention to? 
that I must discipline myself according to God's word. I must discipline myself in God's word. I must discipline myself with God's word. If I spent five minutes last week, I want to spend 10 minutes this week. And this every day, brothers and sisters in Christ, realizing, realizing that the threat to our growth is the lust, the corrupt nature in us. That the more we bring God's word, the greater we bring into subjection the lust of the flesh. The more you stay away from God's word, the more lust prevails in your life. Have you not seen that already? You know when you don't pray. You know when you don't read. You know when you don't study God's word. You know what happens inside of you. The thorns and the thistles of, uh, of lust and the flesh and the corrupt nature grows wild. Wild it grows. It's fertile ground for the flesh. It grows so wild that it chokes your growth. Chokes it indeed. Death and decay are the result. Ah, but when you spend time in God's word, reading verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book, learning and growing in Christ, there's another growth taking place. The thorns and the thistles of the corrupt nature and the flesh get cut down, kept under control. And the spiritual man on the inward begins to grow. And we see that man and woman of God in the church. We end with this in verse 4. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises. So by them you may become partakers of his divine nature. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. There is the precious and magnificent promises of God. Peter describes the promises of God with two words here, magnificent and precious. We begin, let's look at the second one, precious. Precious, we normally use to describe a gem, a gold, diamonds, those jewels are precious. And Peter uses that to describe the promises of God. They are precious, meaning they are of high value. The promises of God are of high value to every believer. They're magnificent in the sense of how we see them in a panoramic view. They're awesome. They're beyond our imagination. They're magnificent. They're glorious. They're better than anything we see in the world today. For by these he has also granted us. And that's the second granted. The first granted we saw in verse 3. Sorry, verse 2. Here in verse 4 is the second granted. For by these he has granted to us. Again, the action verb, past tense. He's already given it to us. For by these he has also granted to us his precious promises. Not ours, not the world's, not anybody else's, but his precious and magnificent promises. Oh, friends, what are these promises? We can, we can, we can start now and we'll go all through the afternoon rejoicing over the promises of God. Ah, how well, great it is, the promises of God. Beginning in the book of Genesis, we see the promise of God. The promise of God, the proto-evangelion. What is the proto-evangelion? Proto meaning first, evangelion is the gospel. The first gospel is not in Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. The first gospel, the proto-evangelion is in the book of Genesis where God says, uh, out of the seed of the woman will come a man, a boy, who will crush the serpent. That's a promise of God. Amen. The promise of God that out of the woman will come a man, a boy, a child who will be Yeshua HaMashiach, the Jesus of the Bible, God incarnate, who will hang on the cross and crush the head of the serpent with his atoning work on Calvary's cross. That's a promise of God in the book of Genesis. All the way in the beginning, the promise of God in the book of Genesis. And all the way through, the promises of God. And you, my dear friends, are living in the promise of God today. That God says he's a good shepherd, for example, that he will keep his people He's kept you. He's keeping you. The promise of God to save you. That he saves to the uttermost those. He calls, that those who call on him, he will never reject. He will save. That's a promise of God. As we made clear in Bristol yesterday, call on God and he will save you. As we said to the Muslim boy yesterday, call on Jesus Christ and he will save you. As we said to the man who doubted God yesterday, call on God and he will save you. The promise of God indeed to save to the uttermost those who call on him. The call of God, the promise of God made clear to you today is a promise that he will return for his people. Amen. 
And amen. This is the great and glorious promises from God. A promise to you today. Are you? Is your soul not rejoicing in the Lord this morning? Is your soul not rejoicing in the Lord this morning? That all of these things have been granted to you already. 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 That you might be the partakers of the divine nature. The divine nature here, here is the born again nature. Not that you may be like God. For you can never be like God. God is God. But you might be living truly in the divine nature. Meaning living truly as a born again person. So God says through Peter. That you can indeed live in divine nature. Here upon the face of the planet. You can truly live a born again life. On the face of the planet. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. You are one walking through this world, going towards a new heaven and the new earth. And your testimony is, I'm living this born again life by what God has already granted to me. And I've escaped the corruption. That is our testimony. That is our life. If that is you today, may the Lord grow you even further. But if that is not you today. If that is not you today, then may you pray this morning and say, Lord, I want to be that. I want to be what Peter says. I want to be what this preacher is describing today. I want to be this man who's growing in you, having escaped the corruption, having escaped the lust. And I do not want my life to be described as a life of lust, but a life of growth in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Is that you this morning? Is that your prayer this morning? As we come to the Lord's Supper this morning, May that be your prayer as you partake of the Lord's Supper this morning. May that be your personal call unto God this morning as you call out unto the Lord in the Lord's Supper this morning. Let's pray. Our good and gracious God, we give you thanks and praise today for the opportunity you've given us to love you and to worship you and to glorify your name. We want to grow, Lord, a little further. Lord, a discernment of my heart that you've given me, I recognize a congregation that wants to grow. A people that want to grow. There are men and women here, Lord, who are seeking earnestly to grow in you. They want nothing of this world. They want nothing of the entanglements of this world. They recognize the corrupt nature, the lust that seeks to prevail. And they want to grow in you. Lord, I want to grow in you. We ask you, almighty God, help us both young and old. Help us in the pulpit and in the pews to be recognized as a people who have, who have counted upon what has already been granted to us. Those great and glorious promises that you've granted us. What has been already given to us by your providential hand on Calvary's cross. Almighty God, for this we pray through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's prepare our hearts.